Praise God. I'm glad that y'all were able to make it into the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. I'm excited to be a servant of God. I'm excited to live for the Lord. Amen. I'm excited that he's even given me enough sense to know that. Amen. <laughs> I hope that uh, as you continue to be part of the fellowship, you know, that you continue to grow in your understanding and that you start to get a revelation, you know, of what God is really doing on the earth and that, that we would be able to see clearly with spiritual eyes what God is doing. Amen. That's my prayer. Praise God. All right. So listen, last week what we did was we actually preached out of 1 Samuel chapter 16. And if you'll remember, there was a, a major turning point really in the kingdom of God. Uh, where the children of Israel had previously said, we want to be like the other nations. Now, i got to be careful I don't start preaching on that all over again, but how often times do we, even in modern times, want to have what other people have? How many times do we judge success, especially American success, based upon what other people have and then our desire to attain to what they have? And I'm here to tell you that that same spirit is the spirit of the world that was working in Israel back then is still working and alive and well today. But the children of Israel wanted a king like the other nations. And if you'll remember, one of the things that we talked about was that through the scriptures, we can see that many of these kings were what we would call these Nephilim. You know, and some people would say, man, you're getting way too much into it. No, 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 we ain't getting enough into the supernatural. They got, if you want a very, listen, I'm all about practicality, but if it's not spiritual, then it's not practical in the eyes of God. That's my position. I, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. And I realize that there's a lot of other people, a lot of other pastors that probably been doing this longer than me that would disagree with me. I understand that. I've listened to what they said, but I don't agree with them. So there's, there's other options out there is what I'm saying. What I'm trying to tell you is this, and I believe that God wants you to know. I believe God wants you to know the supernatural. I believe God wants you to have a supernatural worldview. I don't believe that God wants you walking around on earth thinking, that only thinking in what you can see visibly, only thinking in what you can see in practicality. I believe God wants you to understand that there is a spiritual realm and that you are not in a battle against flesh and blood, but that you are in a battle with spiritual entities that are trying to usurp or to take over the authority of God and trying to steal from God what belongs to him. And can I tell you something? That you belong to God. If you are in this house this morning and you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you belong to God. If you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then guess what? You're not part of the kingdom of God and you don't belong to the Lord and you are still in bondage to the enemy. There are them and he said, listen, you're not going to be happy with your decision. And many times in our own lives, we think that we want certain things, and it's not until later that we realize that we kind of wish that we wouldn't ask for what we got. Amen. God said, you really don't want Saul, but if that's what you think you want, he will allow you with your free will to demand what it is that you want. And then once you get it, if you ain't happy with it, don't blame God. Come on. See, that's a tactic of the enemy. I need you to know that. Amen. That so many times the enemy sees a lie on the inside of God's people and and. He, and and convinces them that they want something that's outside of God's will. And then when they get it and they're miserable with it, guess who they blame? Yeah. They blame the Lord. The enemy comes in stealthily, wily, deceitfully, and he causes a man, a man or a woman's heart to go against their, own, their God that loved them. And they blame God for it. It wasn't God to begin with. It was the enemy that sowed that lie in their heart. <coughs> And then whenever Samuel went to go anoint Jesse's son, you remember that? He went through the whole succession of all the sons, and the, and the Lord told Samuel, don't look at his stature. Talking about the, his height. Because you remember Saul was head and shoulders above the crowd. Eliab was also very tall. And so here again, we have within the context, their worldview that they knew about these giants. Listen, the giants all up in this story we're about to read this morning. These, these, these giants that were in the land, well, why we ain't never seen no skeletons, man? Why we ain't never seen no pictures? Oh, they got the pictures out there, my friend, back from the 1800s even. And, you know, why you don't see skeletons? Let me tell you something. If they found, let's just say, a 10-foot skeleton, 
Okay, I'm just trying to make a point because some of you, I know some of y'all are logical. Uh, give me some science data, and then I'll believe. You know, uh, then no, no, God doesn't work according to the scientific method, my friend. God gives you His word, and He says you believe it or you don't. Amen. But I will say this: let's just let's just humor ourselves. Do you think within this world that is so against the belief in God? This world where the most powerful of people are atheistic and want to denounce God. Do you believe for one second that if they actually archaeologically found a 10-foot skeleton that they would just put it in the Smithsonian Institute so that you could see it? Of course they wouldn't. How foolish would that be? Because it would tear down everything that they have been working so hard to build, which is a narrative of evolution that denies God the creator because it would specifically state that hit a portion of his word that seemed impossible was actually true. Yep. So that's the world I live in, my friend. No, no, no. Science is not right, and then and then and, and, God, and God's word has to be proven within the realm of science. No, 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 no. No, God's word is right, yes, and the world of science has to be proven within the realm of God's word. That's where I live. I live in a spiritual world that even though I can't see it all, I'm here to tell you, look, God has convinced me that, 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 that these spiritual entities are against me because they don't want me to be free so that I can be used for the will of God. Because God's doing something on this earth. Yes. God said to, to Samuel, don't you, don't you look upon his stature. He said, man looks at the outward appearance. I am God. Dude, there's so much that I can. How much time could we spend on that? That the eyes of man deceive him, and that even the uh, you know, fancy word of accoutrements of life, or the niceties of life, or the material possessions of life. Oh, look at the outward appearance of that thing, and it looks beautiful. Or look at the outward appearance of that person's life. Look at all. Oh, he's blessed. Look, he's got thirty thousand people in his church. He's so. Man, man. God said, I don't want to do that. I'm looking at the inside. Amen. Amen. So that's the narrative now that we're turning the page and we're moving into this next chapter. And I want to read, I want to read this to you. And I, I was planning on reading the whole chapter, but it's just way too much information to read. So I feel like the Lord showed me where to stop reading, and then we'll just tell the story, and then we'll get into the message. Amen? All right, here we go. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And we're gathered together at Shoko. Now I want you to just see what I highlighted right there. You see that? Which belongeth to Judah. I just want you to cut that in the back of your brain. And pitched between Shoko and Azekah and Ephesim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. And set the battle in array against the Philistines. So you can imagine what does that mean. They got in their formation and they're ready to go to battle. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in the span. Listen, there's a couple of spots that I found in the Bible where it keeps repeating the number six. And I'm going to tell you that... God created man on the sixth day. And i got to tell you in the book of Revelation that it says that the mark of the beast is the number of a man. And that the number is 666 because it's the fulfillment of man. Because see, the enemy's lies has tried to convince man that what he wants to do is not to, not to serve like all of that crazy stuff that's out there in this world. But can I tell you that was the original lie of Satan in the garden? <clears throat> That, that if the day that you eat, surely that if you eat of this, you will not die, but instead you will know. Some special intellectualism, some special knowledge, some special illumination, and you will become as God. You no longer have to be subservient to God. If you will attain to this higher level of understanding and this higher level of knowledge, you yourself will become a God. That is a lie of Satan. That is the pride of, Lu of Lucifer that, that caused him to fall to begin with. And he has been trying to impart that lie on the inside of human beings. But listen, 666. Six, six. Every time you see this number 6 when it's repeated like this, and especially within the overall context of something like this, an enemy of God coming against the people of God, I'm telling you, it's got meaning right here. 
Six cubits in the span, he had a helmet of brass upon his head, he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him, and he stood, and he cried unto the armies of Israel, and he said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Why are you getting all dressed up? Why are you getting in your little formation? Am not I a Philistine and you service to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me if he be able to fight with me and to kill me. Then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants, you know, I just got hit by something right here. I never even thought about this. I've been reading this passage for the last three days. And I was thinking to myself, why God just didn't rush it? You know what I'm thinking? Like, no, I mean, here you are. You're an army of God. And you got this multitude of people. And God is behind you. And, like, why do you all just don't go forward in the, the battle and rush him? Rush the whole army. How much are your chances better to take out this lion giant? If everybody that has spears and swords and all of these other things are just rushing upon the enemy, yeah. right? Yeah, you're going to take a chance, but is the Lord behind you or not? Well, we're going to get into that a little bit more. The point that I wanted to really make and all that, I feel like what the Lord told me in that little split second was talking about unity. That there's power when we storm in the gates. The, the, the gates of heaven and we come together and we ask the Lord to unify and to work in us and through us. Amen. There's power in God's people. It's just waiting there for the Lord to, to use us. Amen. And serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, look at this, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They were terrified. The idea behind dismayed is that they were they were shaken. You ever been kind of nervous before? I, I've been kind of nervous before. I've been in a little bit of altercations before where I'm like, no, 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 I don't know exactly how this thing's going to go down. And I felt it, the little bit of nervousness kind of like making a little wobble in my knees a little bit. It's okay to... When, once it starts really getting going and the adrenaline starts flowing, it's going to be all right. It's going to stabilize out a little bit. Your knees are going to come back to you. Okay, but that's what was happening. Fear was being stricken in their heart and they were becoming terrified as they would look at this thing that was bigger than them and bigger than their mind could perceive. Yeah. Now, David was the son of that Ephratite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. Now, enter David, right? The man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab. Remember him from last week, right? The firstborn, and next unto him, Abinadab. And the third was Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep in Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for your brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to your brothers and carry these ten cheeses up unto their captain of their thousand and look how your brethren fare and take their pledge or get their testimony. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Not really. I mean, that's what everybody thought. Everybody thought that the armies of Israel are in Shoko, F.S. Damon, and they are near the valley of Elah. There they fight for our God. Not, not really. They're not really fighting. That's what everybody thinks. But in reality, what's happening is they're all dressed up. They're all prepared for battle. But each and every day, for 40 days, in the morning and at night, the giant gets up and he says the same thing. And David rose up early in the morning, and he left his sheep with a keeper, and he took any wind as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host or the army was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brothers. And as he talked with them, behold, here it comes. <laughs> Behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, 
and spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. See, ain't nobody fighting. I need you to understand that. He's saying what he's saying, and they're getting scared, and they're running in the opposite direction. And they were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that is... Oh, look, something else just hit me as I was reading this. One of the ways that I kind of started this service was I said that many times we believe in life that one thing or another is going to bring us fulfillment and happiness, right? And so we endeavor on a journey to try to get these things that we believe are going to bring fulfillment in us. But that what we were saying is, is that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek what it is that God is wanting to communicate through his word of what he's doing and allow God to use you in that. And that the end result is that he takes care of you. And in this particular passage of scripture, the king is saying, listen, if, if you can take him down, then I will enrich your life. And I need you to know that in the kingdom of God, it is similar to that. Many times we think that this is what I need a little bit more money to pay my life bill. I'm just trying to tell you that you can't look at God like a spiritual lottery. That's the word of faith doctrine, and that's a lie from the devil, too. Well, you know, plant your thousand dollar seed and you get glory out of your life. He wants to position you and prepare you. You, 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 know, you know, sometimes I think in the kingdom of God or even in the church, you know, when it comes to giving, I listen, I'm not going to shrink back from talking about giving. I hardly ever talk about giving. But, but it's like, you know, we, we think, oh, if I give this thousand dollars, if that's what you're, if you made ten thousand dollars a month, okay, if, if you made ten thousand dollars a month, if I give this thousand dollars, look at how much that I could, that I could do with this thousand dollars, or if I make five hundred dollars, if I give this fifty dollars, that's what my light bill is, or that's what my insurance payment for, for the car note, or whatever. How am I going to pay this? No, you got to trust the Lord. And when you give to the kingdom of God, I'm telling you, why don't you test it in this? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what he said in Malachi? Test me in this. Pay your tithes and your offerings. See that I will not open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you are not even able to contain. And so the money preacher, the problem with the money preacher is he says, if you do this, then you're going to get this. And so when a person has a greedy heart, when they say, oh, I'm going to get this $1,000, I'm about to get my $10,000 back. And when they don't get it in a month, when they don't get it in two months, three months, six months, nine months, a year, five years, and then guess what? The enemy's over there just tackling in their ear. You stupid fool. You gave your money to a God that's not even. He took your money and he didn't give you. God never told you to do it with the wrong motive like that. God wanted you to know that he is sovereign, that the heaven and the earth and all that in them is, is his. The very breath of the inside of your lungs is his. He don't ask for the same sin. right with the other 90% that I'll let you have, you wouldn't even be in this bond. But because you live beyond your means, oh, we went to preaching and we went from preaching to meddling, because you live beyond your means, how can you speak so strongly and boldly about this preacher because I've done it? Amen. Amen. Lived beyond my means, built up debt, got under the bondage of usury and 25% per interest rate from Chase Manhattan Bank to Rockefeller's. Oh, Lord, don't let me get into all that. Right? And, and, and allow yourself to become a bondage, a slave to the bondage of money. And, all right. Great riches will he give him. And the daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spoke. To the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine? He's like, wait, wait, hold on, say what? Say that again. You trying to tell me that if somebody goes and takes down this giant, they're going to get some stuff for it? Because I'm pretty much thinking already right now, somebody just needs to stand up and go do it for free. Because how are y'all listening to this for 40 days? And take away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now listen, there's a whole lot of thought just in that one little line. Two words. Uncircumcised Philistine. I mean, if you understand the word of God, and you understand what circumcision represents, it represents, yes, the cutting away of flesh through the shedding of blood, but it's a type. We preached about it a while back. 
Does God let you just be willing to believe the word of the Lord and believe my faith and invite this Jesus that I preach to you on the inside of your heart? There'll be a circumcision on the inside of the flesh of your heart, and he'll change on the inside. See, the work of the new covenant is a work on the inside. It's a work of grace that changes a man on the inside. And then there's a reflection outwardly yeah. of the fruit of God being produced. Yeah. You want to see the victory produced outwardly? You got to have the change first inwardly. Amen. Amen. So they came, wait, who's this uncircumcised Philistine? I know he's big and I know he's ugly, but he's uncircumcised. What does that mean? He's not even in covenant. He's outside of covenant. Who is the God of this earth anyway? That's kind of like what I feel like he's asking. Who is the God? Of, is Dagon God? That's the God of the Philistines. Is Dagon the fish God God? No, because guess what? You ought to already know that. They should have known that. Because if you remember the story, whenever Saul became king, he said, Hell, you get the ark. Let's go fight the Philistines. What happened? The Philistines stole the ark. You remember that? Now, so this is all before David. But David is very aware of this. The Philistines stole the ark. I'm just shooting from the hip now. They put the ark on the inside of Dagon's temple. Guess what? They woke up the next morning. What happened? He was on his face. The statue was on his face before the ark moved. <laughs> oh, they lifted it back up. They went back out. They come back the next day. They come back and he's all broke up. I'm, I'm shooting from the hip. I'm pretty sure his arms were broken. He ain't got no power. Broken arms. What you gonna do, Dagon? You gonna bow? To Yahweh. That's what you're going to do. You're going to bow to the God of Israel. And David's saying, you over here, this guy's not even in covenant with your God. Who is the God of this earth? Is it Yahweh or is it Dagon? He's trying to tell him, listen, man, you're in covenant with God. God's going to fight for you. God's going to win the victory for you. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that kills him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, look at this. Heard when he spoke unto the men, Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Isn't that something? And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few little sheep in the wilderness? You see what's going on here? Have you ever been in a situation where somebody speaks to you in a condescending yeah, manner? Really. Huh? Yeah. He's trying to belittle them. What is it, little sheep? What did you do with your little sheep? All right, don't you see that I'm a man of war? Look how much taller I am than you, David. What did you do with your little sheep out there? Go chew along, little boy. Uh, Look what he says. Uh, I know your pride. And I hope you can already see it. Like, wait, who's prideful here? Yeah. And I know the naughtiness of your heart. When you come, have come down here that you might see the battle. What battle? There's not even a battle, man. It's just a the liar talking trash and you like shaking in your boots. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? Oh, that's so powerful. Could you not just preach a message for an hour on is there not a cause? <laughs> Meaning, who is your God? Who do you serve? What is going on in the midst of this? Is there not a cause? Yes, there's a cause. His name is Yahweh. That's the name that they call him in the Old Testament. Manifested. His name is Jesus. Like the song saying, what did it say? There is power in the name of Jesus. Is there not a cause? You better believe there's a cause. Because as all these human beings sc scurry around this earth like a, little, like a bunch of angry ants that had their little dirt mound busted up, trying to make all of their little stuff happen on this earth. God is saying, what about me? What about my people? Will they bring me glory? Will they live for me? That's what God wants to know is their cause. Isn't there a cause, teenager, whenever you're going to school and, 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 you, and you're living your life and, and you're not really giving glory to God? Isn't there not a cause? Isn't there not a cause? Uh, something bigger than just raising your children or just getting up and going to work so that you can pay your bills? Is there not a cause? Yes, raise your children in the ways of the Lord. And then pray for them. We need to pray more. Yeah. And then we need to trust God more. Yeah. Is there not a cause? I'm trying to tell you there's a cause that's yeah. bigger yeah. than your human plight. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. I know that people don't like this kind of preaching because it's not folk, it's not relevant. You're not being relevant to my personal life, preacher. I want you to be relevant to me. No, no, no. Go down the road and get that. Stick to the word of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And he turned from him toward another, and he spoke after the same. Well, Eliab don't want to listen to me. What about you? 
And the people answered him again out of the former. And when the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul. They, they got this little, this little messy mouth kid up in the camp, and he's stirring everybody up, King Saul. And David said to Saul, so Saul sent for him. He said, let no man's heart fail. Listen to the confidence in this young striker. Listen to him. He says, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant. We'll go and fight with this Philistine. I mean, just listen to the humility of this. There's so much confidence, but yet there's so much humility. Your servant, king. I mean, because if you think about it, why the king did Why did why you you had chosen taller than everybody saw? Why did you go out there and lead the march? Why did you go out there and fight fight the giant? You see, he, but, but, but David humbles him. Your servant. We'll go and fight this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, your servant kept his father's sheep. You see the little sheep that you're making fun of, Ilium? See, you've been doing yourself a little bit better job. Had you spent a little time in the pasture. Yeah. Your father's sheep, and there came a lion <coughs> and a bear and took the lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and I smote him. And delivered it out of his mouth. <laughs> Isn't that something, dude? Think about that. This don't belong to you, you lion, lion. This don't belong to you, bear. Give me my sheep back out of that mouth of that animal. <laughs> and he arose against me, and I caught him by his beard, and I smote him, and I smote him. Is that impossible for you to believe? He believed that human, that, that even a young teenager could 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 be made in such a way to. That God could move through him yes. and to bring yep. a victory like that? Yep. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. I, I believe yeah. it. Does it seem supernatural? Yeah, because it is. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that the dude's not agile. As a matter of fact, I think he's probably very agile. I'm not trying to say that he's not fast. I'm not trying to say he's not quick. I'm not saying he doesn't have fast hands because I believe he's got all that. Right. But guess what? What he got better than that is he got the spirit of the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Moving through him with all of those things yes. that he's been gifted with for that perfect opportunity. Because you see, he didn't even know it when he killed that lion in that bear. That God was just preparing him for something else. Right. See, while he's over here in this field by himself with God alone, right. and God slowly bringing the tests and the trials his way to give him an opportunity to trust God, yes. to fill up his confidence for something bigger, because God's like, I'm about to put you on the stage, my friend. I'm about to put you in the place where I'm about to use you to bring glory to myself. I gotta bring you along a little slowly. I gotta let you face some stuff. I gotta let you to see my hand working in your life. He said, your servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. Yeah. Look at this. I'm about to stop reading and we're going to start talking. And Saul armed David with his armor. See that? Let's go ahead and just see if we can highlight that. His armor. Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also, he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor. And he is saved. And we're going to, when we break down the word, I'm going to use the NASB Bible because it kind of explains it a little differently. But look. The word of Satan means he, he began his journey to move forward. So he's got all this armor on, and he's trying to put the sword on top of the armor, and he gets ready to move forward to go, for he had not proved it. Yeah. The word prove means a tested. Many times this old English word of proving, it has the idea of a metal worker testing the purity of the precious metal to see how much, you know, it's putting something to the test is what the idea is. And he said, I haven't put these to the test. In other words, I've never fought with all this clanky armor before. Yeah. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. Mm -hmm. And David put them off of him. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. Now listen, real quick, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about the story. So what we see here 
is that the children of Israel are camped, and young David shows up. I love this picture, by the way. And that's not that little, that little teenager holding that big old head up running down. And that's not this is victory, man. Listen, you know how much spiritual truth is laid within that? Just within that truth, if you go back to the garden and you remember that slippery serpent and how the word of the Lord said, and the seed of the woman will crush your head, crushing the head of a serpent. And now we got this six, six lion seed of the devil that, guess, look what he did. He cut his head off. In the end, I didn't read that part to you, but he cut his head off. But, but I want you to know that he shows up to the camp. And everybody's living in fear, and this enemy of God is taunting the people of God. And David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a reason for the people of God to stand up and to move forward in the things of God? And so that God would get the victory, so that God would receive the glory upon earth? Is there not a cause? And then the word gets out. To Saul, and Saul says, well, okay, if you insist on going into battle, at least put on some of this armor. Trying to convince young David to fight the way he would have fought, had he been willing to fight. And David's like, well, no, that's not going to work, because see, these things haven't been tested, because I've fought for God before, and I didn't fight this way. There's a different way that I've learned to fight. Through Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I just imagine at some point in time as he approached that Philistine, was the sun behind the Philistine? Did it cast a shadow in that long valley? Did David at some point walk out from underneath this? I don't know. I can't prove it. But boy, it's a good, it's a thought. Yea, though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff. They comfort me. And there he walks towards the enemy and he just... He's picking up his stones, and you can just about imagine what this line, this, this Philistine is thinking. I mean, this is comical. This is humorous. And he, and he ends up telling, he said, I have a dog that you come out to me with a stick in your hand. He said, I'm going to feed you to the end. And David just stops him. He says, no, man. God, if you find yourself in a valley and a shadow is being cast over you and you find yourself in the midst of darkness and you don't know what else to do, just whisper the name. There's a song that says, whisper his name, Jesus, call on his name, Jesus. Listen, sometimes it's about whispering that name, Jesus, Jesus. I remember, I told the story before, but I remember whenever my sister came to our house when I was 13. I told my mama the next morning, I said, Mama, I'm trying to call for your name. You couldn't hear me. My sister came to our house when I was 13 years old, and I had never seen anything like this before. She started saying Jesus. She started talking about Jesus. And I was like, dude, this is so weird. Where did this come from? She's talking about Jesus. She won't shut up about Jesus. And I can remember, I went to sleep that night. And as I was praying, because I was saying my prayers, and I said, Lord, I bet she doesn't mean that. Well, I don't know why I said that. I'm just being real with you. When I said that, I don't know if you've ever heard about lucid dreams and sleep paralysis and all that weird spiritual stuff that I'm telling you, if you ever experienced it, you'd know there was something spiritual out there. Robert told me I could always share his testimony. When Robert got out of prison, then something happened to him and his bed and the dog was in bed with him and his dog puked all over the cover, right? And then it happened. And so there it was, and I couldn't hear anything but the rushing of blood through my body and my heart beating out of my chest. And I, I was stiff. I couldn't move. And I was trying to get mama. And I couldn't say mama. And then all of a sudden, the thought came, oh whisper yeah. his name. <laughs> whisper his name. And I said, Jesus. And it was like, boom, in the spiritual realm. It was just all gone. <laughs> And I didn't even understand it as a little boy at that time, but do you realize that what just happened there? Yeah. My sister came over there saying the name of Jesus. The enemy tried to convince yeah. me that she yeah. was crazy. I, I called that out. The Lord said, maybe you need a little taste of something right yeah. here. And then as soon as I whispered that name, yeah. boom! There's power in the name of Jesus. You might find yourself in a valley one day. I'm here to tell you that if you call on his name, yes. he will show up to you. And so, so there he goes, and he finds these five smooth stones. And the Bible says that the stone found its way into the forehead of the giant and sunk itself up in there. It wasn't just his skill, my friend. That's right. Uh, 
I know I keep saying it every time I preach it. I think I preached this two months ago. I, I feel like he was probably left-handed. I don't know why. I feel like he was like a left-handed baseball pitcher. I feel, and, and listen, I feel like he had skill. But look, it was the Lord that took that rock out of that agile arm of David and all that practice that he had been doing in the, in the field. Because if he wasn't praying and he wasn't writing a psalm and he wasn't playing the harp, he wasn't, he, harp and he wasn't killing lions and he wasn't killing bears, he was practicing with that sling. And the Lord took that stone, boom, and sunk it into the head of that. I wonder how long it took for that giant to fall. You know? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. I wonder how much of a, I wonder how much dust came up from the ground. Maybe there wasn't dust down there. There was a brook. I don't know. But I wonder, how long did it take? How, how much disbelief in the crowd, both right. the Israelites and the right. folks? Right, and believe it. Yeah. How, I would imagine a, a hushed silence over yeah. the crowd. Yeah. You yeah. see what I'm saying? I can't prove it, but I, I would imagine a hushed <laughs> silence came over the crowd. And then the Bible says that David didn't have a sword. You know what he did? He took off running because he's like, this ain't finished yet. You got to remove the head from the snake. Anybody that's ever tried to kill a snake before knows you can stomp on his head. And I mean, don't get me wrong, if you crush it good enough, he won't come make his comeback. But that was why you got to cut the head off the snake. And he takes Goliath's own sword, and he cuts that giant's head off with it. The Bible says he picked that head up. That's what that picture's all about. The Bible says he picked that head up, and he took it back to Jerusalem with it. Now, there's a whole lot that can be said about that. Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Goliath of Gath. Golgotha, Goliath. Okay, I don't even have time to try to break all that down right now, but... There's a lot more to the story. David finds that sword later on in life whenever he's running from Saul. Okay, but nevertheless, what I want you to see right now is he cuts the head off of that enemy and he lifts it up to the crowd. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm imagining if they were quiet, that they're not too quiet anymore. <laughs> right? When he lifts that head up, I can just hear them erupt. In celebration, erupted and all of a sudden, I would imagine that victory entered their heart. Can you imagine that? Did you see what just happened? And I would imagine at that point, they finally rushed the enemy. And the Bible says that, that they won the victory that day. Amen? So, I wanted you to get a little bit of a picture. But I feel like this time I'm preaching this message, and I've seen some things a little bit different from a different angle that I never saw before. First off... I want you to know that the title of my message is Victory in the Valley. I want you to know that David won a victory. And I want you to see something also that testing. See, there was a lot of testing going on in this chapter. There, and, and listen, the words valley and the concept of 40 days coincide with the concept of a, of a valley situation. In other words, when we speak spiritually, man, I'm in a valley. Well, one of the things that you need to understand is, is that... It, it, you're going through a trial. God will allow you to go through valleys so that he can show up for you to give you the victory so that the next time you're in a valley, you will know even better how to get your victory. Amen. But repeatedly within the word of God, the, the concept of 40 days is connected to being tested. I just got to, you got to trust me on that. Testing Jesus for 40 days. Do you remember that? For 40 days he was in the wilderness and the enemy come and tempted him, right? Israel for 40 years. Look at Deuteronomy 8.2 real quick. Deuteronomy 8.2, I'm going to uh, bring that up because I want you to see because it talks about the testing. Deuteronomy 8.2, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. That he might humble you, testing you. To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now listen, I didn't put the scripture in here, but I need you to be reminded of the parable of the sower real quick. You remember the story of the sower? A sower went out to sow. Some seed fell along the wayside and the fowl of the air, which represents the enemy, stole it. Some seed fell around, along stony ground. Some seed fell amongst the thorns. The thorns rose up along with the seed of the seed is the word of God. The thorns rose up and they wrapped around the seed of the word of God and they choked it out. And this, the thorns represent the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. What I want you to know is this. You will be tested. And we call ourselves 
yourself Christian, which means to be one like Christ. If you think the test isn't coming, you're wrong. Amen. See, the enemy's plan for the test is to destroy your faith. But God's plan for the test is that you would come out victorious yes. and that your faith would be strengthened. Amen. Amen. So that's what he said. I, I had to test you to see whether or not you were really going to serve me or not. Okay. So within this story, I see these four people. Listen, Goliath is the antagonist of the story. But within this story, these four people, I believe, are going through their own form of the test. Saul, Israel as a, as a group. Iliad, David, right? Saul, real quick, he wants the glory. Israel, fearful of the enemy. Eliab, full of envy and selfishness. David, trust God for victory. Amen? Well, let's take a look real quick at Eliab, full of envy and selfishness. He's so focused on what he is missing out on and what David is getting that he can't even see that Satan is gaining ground in God's territory. I just want to make that point. Last week we learned that I thought he was going to be king for a split <coughs> second and then it was taken away from him. Right. Now, have you ever felt envy on the inside of your heart? Listen, if you've never recognized envy, once God starts moving away problems with drugs and alcohol and internet, I'm listening to Pastor Brad preach, and I've said this before, he said something and, I, and this is what entered into my head. I'm just telling you what the truth was. Pastor Brad, I know you probably don't watch it if you do. I want you to know this happened. What happened? I thought in my head, I could have said that better than him. Now, first of all, if anybody ever heard Brad <coughs> preach, you already know that he was a much better communicator than I'll ever be. But secondly, what the Lord did was said, look at your heart. In the heart that's a lust of the flesh, and if you're not going to let me deal with that, then you're going to have a problem. Listen, some people never even make it to that level in yeah, the Christian walk. Right. Some people just walk around with envy and jealousy and malice and all of this stuff in their heart. They don't even realize it's in there. I'm here to tell you, God wants to break through all that other garbage so that he can get down to the nitty gritty so that he can really do a work in us. Why? So he can do a work yes. through us. That's right. He wants to do a work through us. But until he can do a work through us, he's got to do a work in us. Here's Eliab, full of envy, full of selfishness. Have you, have you ever seen that? Somebody got a promotion. You know, oh, he got a promotion. Why didn't he give that promotion to me? <laughs> well, well, first off, the Lord knows how to get promotion. Yeah, that's right. And you're like, well, I don't even understand. That's not even fair. I mean, that guy did not even do that good of a job. Well, guess what? Sometimes bosses aren't right. <laughs> Sometimes there's something bigger going on that the Lord is trying to show you. You got a problem. I purposely let that person get a promotion over you just so I could show you this little thing in your heart that I'm trying to deal with because you call yourself my child. Yeah. See, whenever you call yourself my child, and you no, 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 ain't nothing easy money about this, but don't you worry. If you line up with the Lord, the Lord is the author of promotion. He knows how to to leapfrog you over so fast that it'll make your head spin and make everybody else's head spin. That's right. Amen? Jesus. But Eliab's so focused, listen, he don't even see that the enemy trying to steal God's stuff. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that we can get so caught up in this life and on this earth with all of these things going on around us, oh man, they don't appreciate me at work. You know, my family member doesn't love me. Nobody's recognizing how good I, you know, what, how hard I work. This is they ain't working for them anyway. Right. Learn your humility like David said. Your servants will take the Philistine now. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself in the eyes of God and let God exalt you. Yeah. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty name of God that in due time he That's may good. exalt you. And you just stay true to Jesus. I'm telling you right now, he will take care of you. Yes. Why? Because he, it's his plan. He's a good God. God. He's a good God. But guess what? He, and can I, and hope, I hope I don't misrepresent him. He wants to get glory. Amen. And I'm going to tell you why. See, some people say, well, you son of God. That all he ever talks about is him getting the glory. That's because you can't see the other stuff that's going on in the spiritual realm. Right. All these other gods are trying to take the glory away from him. All these other gods are trying to say, hey, look at our Goliath. Look at our, look at this God. Worship him. Fear him. No, God says this. You don't fear him who can destroy your body. You fear
fear him that can destroy both body and soul. Amen. Live for the Lord. Amen. That's Ilya's problem. Israel's fearful of the enemy. They get dressed up every day. They put on their armor. They get in battle array. They shout the battle cry. <coughs> but they ain't nobody fighting. And, and I know I've said this many times, but the Lord revealed this to me. The first time I read this after God started giving me some victory, he said, that's my church right there. You That's see so that? Yeah. They all dressed up. They show them. I'm not talking about y'all. No, 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 no. Y'all are some Davids in the waiting, my friend. I'm talking about the modern big behemoth thing that calls itself the church that is so full of secret sensitivity, so full of the word of faith, so full of lying doctrine that calls itself the church that, that is over there living in fear. They're getting all dressed up. They're saying all the right stuff. Oh, I'm going to trust God for this. I'm going to trust that out there. But listen to me. Can I just say this? They ain't told nobody about Jesus in a month of Sunday. That's See, that's why you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you think it feels weird to come up front and you ain't, I've been up there five times and I've never gotten filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you right now, you need to be asking God to fill yes, you up with Lord, the Holy yes. Spirit. You need the power of God surging on the inside of you. Why? So that you can be a witness yes. for him. What well, is he going to make me act like you, preacher? Because I don't like the way you act. Of course not. He's going to make you act like the best version of you. Hey. And they live in How many times, listen, this happened to me before. I told y'all a while back. I got on, I was on an elevator with somebody and they said something. And it was a perfect opportunity to say something for Jesus. And it was like the enemy gripped in my heart and I shut my mouth and they walked out of the elevator and the elevator doors closed and I was just overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Fear. Well, if I talk about Jesus at work, they're going to get rid of fear. fear. That's good. The first time I told somebody about being born again at the job where I've been for 20-something years, when I walked out of the door, the enemy said, you can't do that. <laughs> That's why I'm telling you, I heard it. That's why I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard it clear as it could be in my spirit. You can't do that. Mm-hmm. And the Lord came right behind and said, oh, yes, you can. You know why? Because I gave you this job, and if they try to take it from you, I'll give you another one. Right. There ain't nobody, you know, the Lord's making it more real to me. I was sharing with Aaron. Guess what? There ain't nobody getting rid of <coughs> nobody until the Lord says. That's right. That's right. Because God wants to strategically place you in an area where you no longer are gripped by fear, and God can use you to be a witness for Him. And sometimes you use words, and sometimes you just, your actions are right. Even right. though Eliab is rude to you and condescending to you, you can respond with the fruit of the Spirit, yeah. which is love, yeah. joy, yeah. peace. Amen. There you go. I know that there was a preacher one time that used to not like it, but there's some truth to it where they said, preach the gospel and, if necessary, use word of faith. And man, that's a cop out. But know what? You know, there's a lot of truth to that. Right? Because right. ain't nobody wants to hear what you got to say if you're living your life another way. Right? All right. Israel's fearful of the enemy. Saul, he wants the glory. You know, I was thinking about this. He tries to convince young David to fight with his armor. You know, I never thought about this until the last time I preached it, but I'm thinking, this joker wants people to think that's him going out there. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I can't prove it, but I feel like this joker wants people to think that's him fighting Goliath. And even if it's not that, he's definitely trying to convince David that this is the way he's going to win. You got to put all this stuff on, man. You're going to face this giant. And, 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 but, but can I tell you that David's like, this stuff don't work. I mean, because think about it. If this stuff works so good, why you ain't want to? Why are you not fighting? <laughs> Saul wants the glory. Saul wants to convince people to fight with these specific kind of weapons. But look what the New Testament says. Put on the whole armor of God. See, let Jesus be your Lord. Yeah. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because listen, 6-6, six, six, Goliath, a spawn of Satan. We're straight up dealing with Satan right here. The type of Satan in the story that we're talking about. The word wiles is the methods, the trickery, the deceit of the enemy. So that you can understand that there's the devil fully in it. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Listen, I want you to know that, yes, on an individual level, this, uh, this pertains to you. So, like, whenever you go to school on Monday or you go to work on Monday and somebody's rude and condescending to you, you feel that thing rise up in you and you feel like you're being attacked. Guess what? That's a method of the enemy. But that's a method of the enemy 
against you as an individual, listen, it's much bigger than that. Do you realize that we're living in the midst of a deception? I'm not trying to get into all that right now, but do you realize that the stuff you see on TV is not even a reality? Like I'm talking about the stuff that must be what you see on the news. That's it. It's not even a reality. That's right. Like this whole world has been shrouded with so much smoke and mirrors and illusion tricks that I'm here to tell you that the narrative that we see, I am convinced that it is not. And how can you be so convinced, preacher? Because the word of God told me right here that he would protect me against the wiles of the devil. Hallelujah. Why set the trap for road runner? Always set the trap. Come around the corner. He was always set the trap. His methods of trickery and deceit. Yes. You do not war against flesh and blood, Christian, but against principalities and powers. World rulers. That's what one of those were. Cosmo Crater. A world ruler. There are fallen angels over nations. There are demon spirits that try to frustrate you as an individual. There are spiritual entities that are against the plan and will of God. And they have created deception. The weapons of your warfare are not carnal. Amen. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I got to tell you, you're not going to win with all this armor of Saul. No. You got to learn to fight like David. You got to trust God for the victory. Look, David doesn't fight the way they fight. So that's what, that's what makes it so weird to many people in the church whenever they don't realize, man, these people believe something different than what we were taught. These people say it different than what we were taught. These people are doing it different than the rest of the church. So they must be wrong. They must be a cult. All this other kind of stuff. Hold on a second. <laughs> Have you taken the time with the word? Or did you just regurgitate what the man before you told him? And the man, he regurgitated what the man before him told him. No, David doesn't fight the way they fight. David was alone in a pasture getting to know God. David learned how, somehow David learned how to surrender when a situation was bigger than him. Can I, can I encourage you with that? That the next time you find yourself in a deal that's bigger than you and you don't have the answer on how to get back, if you would just fall to your knees and say, okay, Lord, no one makes. I give it to you, Lord, and now I see I give it to you, Lord. Won't you go before me in this battle and won't you give the victory? Yes. Yes, he is on the field of battle. Yes, he slings the stone and he wields the sword, but somehow he has learned to allow God to fight through him. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have taught him. Yes. See, that's the beauty of this. David knows he's about to win. You know why? Because, because David's saying, you are belittling my God. Right. God wants to win this victory. He says, look at somebody to stand up and to face this thing. That's good. God wants to win. Listen, I used to think, man, I'm going to have to fast for, hey, listen, I'm going to come against fasting, please, I'm going to have to fast for a day before I preach this message, one of my first messages. You know what the Lord showed me? You need to fast, son, because you get my attention when you fast. But you need to fast for the right reasons. You're not going to earn an anointing or a power from God just because you're fasting enough. What you need to understand, young man, is that I want to show up. Yeah. What you need to understand is I want somebody to speak my truth so that my word will enter into my people's hearts so that I can accomplish what I desire to accomplish in them. You got to believe that I want to show up and give the victory. This day, look at what he says to the, to the Philistine. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. And I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You see, there it is again. God wants the whole earth to know that there is a God in Israel. God wants the whole earth to know that the whole reason he created Israel out of Abraham is so that he could give the world Jesus. So that Jesus could die on the cross. To set the captive free so that the free captive can tell somebody else about the good news of Jesus. Listen, David goes on to 
say this. Not only does he want the whole earth to know, he wants this assembly to know. And that this, all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord, and he will give you into our hands. He doesn't want the earth to know, he wants his church to know. God wants his church to know that this is how God delivers when you put him in the battle. Yes, put him in the battle. Look, as, God, as believers learn to trust God for the victory, God gives the victory. Amen. As God gives the victory, believers learn to trust God. Here we go back again to the lion and the bear. David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. As, as the believers learn to trust God for victory, God gives victory. As God gives victory, believers learn to trust God. Have you ever had a victory from the Lord? He's done it for you once. He's done it for you twice. Guess what? He'll do it for you again. Hallelujah. He'll do it again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw him and was dead, they fled. Put the devil on the run. Amen. Put the devil on the run. Listen to me. Children of God, I said something to you earlier before we got going about, you know, is the Lord going to move us to build buildings and will, will there be people that are willing to teach kids? Man, God, we are not a program church, but I'm here to tell you, I believe with all of my heart that God has a word that he wants to plant on. The run with it is on them. It's between them and the Lord. As, as parents, your duty is to raise your children in the ways of the Lord. As a church, our duty is to reinforce what God has called you to teach to your children. And guess what? As a human being, their choice is to take the free will that God gave them and say, yes, Jesus, or no, Jesus. That's going to be on them. Yes. Right. But you either believe that we got a word to give, and if you believe, praise God, let's, let's give it to the word. Amen? Yes. Cut off the head, and when the champion was dead. See, because together, what we do is in our own little area, we send the devil on. In our own little area, one soul at a time. One soul at a time, my friend. That's what it's all about. One soul at a time. One lost person that's walking in darkness that does not hear. That's what it's all about. And along the way, yes, God will pay your light bill. Along the way, yes, God will give you an upgrade on a car if that is what you need. And along the way, God will give you your house with crown molding if that's really what you need. I just made it. You know, I make fun of crown molding, but look, I like it. <laughs> <coughs> you get the point I'm trying to make. Just make sure we don't get caught up in all these things. Yes. The care of the Lord, right? All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, Shift gears. I'm bringing you into the New Testament real quick. I'm about to end. I promise. But I wanted to give a New Testament truth about this. Out of Romans chapter five, the results of justification. Y'all know I taught a lot on Romans justification. You know what that word means in the Greek idea? The idea in the Greek is this: that God has declared you righteous. I want. I want to say that again. I'm not talking about what your mom said about you. I'm not talking about what your ex-wife said about you. I'm not, oh no, that's awful right there. Mm -hmm. It is. Listen, because look, people, people do make mistakes in their life. There are failures in people's yeah. lives. Yeah. And God is a God of that. And so it don't matter what your ex, well, she got other things she got to deal with. Or your ex-husband or whatever. Your ex-boss, it doesn't, look, what they say about you. That's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about right now is what does God say about you? So the idea of justification is God's declaration that you are no longer guilty, but that instead you have been made innocent. Amen. Well, how did he do that? He's already explained it up to this point, but he did it through Jesus. Because yes. Jesus was the only righteous one. Jesus died on the cross and an exchange took place where he took our guilt and gave us his righteousness. And now when God the Father looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus and not your failure. And the enemy will try everything that he can in your individuality to make you think, oh no, buddy, I know what we did last night. I know what we've been doing all week. You're guilty, guilty, guilty. And the Lord will say, no, you're innocent. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now start believing in that. Oh. Therefore, having been justified by faith. By faith in what? By faith in Jesus and what he did for you on the cross. 
Now we have peace with God. Our Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how you did. Through faith in what Christ has done, he made you righteous, which allowed God to declare you as righteous. Through whom, look, through whom also we have obtained introduction by faith into this grace. Listen, you know what grace is today in this message? Grace is young David having the strength of God on the inside of him to walk up to that giant and fool him. Grace is a product. Listen to me. I'm not trying to get all fancy on you. This is how I talk. Grace is a product of the Holy Spirit yeah. working through what Jesus has already done at the cross. Grace, the definition is this in the Greek language. It's, it's this. Grace is a divine influence on the heart. Divine is God. Influence is the change on the inner man and its reflection in the life. He who was fearful is no longer fearful. He who was bound is no longer bound. He who was in the world is no longer in the world. God says you're righteous. And through your faith in Christ, hallelujah, you now have peace with God. You're on the same team with the Lord, amen? And not only that, you've been introduced into this grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. I want you to see that. We exalt in the hope of the glory of God. We have hope that God will get his glory on this earth and he's using you and I. But my hope is in not because not because Matt's some spe more special than you. No. But because God wants the victory on this earth and he is going to use me because I, by his grace, say, Lord, use me. Yeah. We also exalt in valleys. <laughs> All right? We also exalt the tribulations in the valleys of life, knowing that the valleys bring about perseverance. I was sharing with somebody the other day, I'm like, man, this, this new job is so hard. And I mean, it's somebody that I love a lot. I was like, oh no, boo. You didn't sign the dotted line, baby. You can't quit. You can't quit. You signed the dotted line. You got two years to go, boo. And guess what? You got to make it through. Because if you quit now, guess what? Tomorrow is going to be a little bit easier to quit. Yeah. Yeah. Can't you quit? Oh, yes. There's always a time. People quit all the time. I know that's what everybody else does. And I'm not trying to say there's never a time that the Lord leads you away from where you were. That's not what I'm trying to say. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm trying to say you can't quit when the going gets tough. Perseverance means to be able to endure in the midst of the trials of life through the grace that God has given you. Look, pers perseverance proves character. Think about that. Character, you know, somebody defined character one time as what's going on when nobody else is looking. Right? Young David's in the field. He's worshiping the Lord. The lion comes. The bear comes. Nobody else sees. They, but the, the whole time, God's building him up. God's preparing him for his purpose. Yes. And when you go through the trials of life, you need to start being able to see because this is the Apostle Paul. Who else knows about the trials of life better than Paul? Shipwrecked, left naked, robbed in the mountains as he traveled and they stole his clothes and he got shipwrecked three different times and they beat him multiple times and he was snake bitten on the island of Malta and time after time he got up, they stoned him one time and he said, he got up, he woke up from being stoned and you know what they said, basically kind of dusted himself all he said, let's go to the next town for us. To preach the gospel. He was convinced. Perseverance proves character, and proven character brings hope. Amen. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Isn't that good? Amen. The Holy Spirit wants to give you and I the victory, just like He gave it to David on that day. So, look, this is the conclusion, real quick, just a synopsis. The enemy is stealing from God. The Philistines were in camp that Shoko, which belongs to Judah. He's stealing from God. He's stealing people from God. He's stealing territory from God. He's stealing anything that he can get his hands on. The glory belongs to the Lord. Amen. Yes. God gets the glory when his people allow him to win the battle through him. Singers, musicians, if y'all could just, I know I'll preach long today, but I just feel like we should always go out of the house of God singing praise to the Lord. Amen. God gets the glory when his people allow him to win the battle through them. 
You see that? You, can you see yourself that way this morning? As a vessel through which God wants to work, <coughs> through which God wants to reveal himself to people. I appreciate you being here this morning. I hope that God said something this morning that that will minister to your heart and give you encouragement in Christ to get up tomorrow and to live for Jesus. Amen. But listen, Amen. we need the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. We need to go out of his house giving him glory. Praise God. Lastly, the battle is the Lord's. Let him win for you. Let him win through you. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Praise God.